Why don't we uh, turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer uh, before the sermon time. Uh, we do have some needs that I've been made aware of this week, and, and uh, I'd just like to pray for them before we get into God's Word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for today. Lord, we don't mean that uh, in a shallow way. Lord, we really do thank you for our lives. We thank you for the people who are sitting next to us. Lord, we thank you for putting them into our lives. Lord, we, our lives are blessed because they are here with us, and our lives are blessed because of you, because you have given us this life. You've given us people to fellowship with. You've given us hope for a future. You've given us your son, Jesus Christ, and Lord, you've given us eternal life, and Father, we cannot thank you enough for that. This is our, our meager attempt to glorify you, the God of all creation, uh, in the best way we possibly can, knowing there'll be a day, someday, where we'll see you in your full glory, and there'll never be uh, a better way to worship you uh, face-to-face, a, with a pure heart, and, and on our knees, and Lord, we just, we just long to, for that day where we can be with you in your kingdom forever. Lord, for the prayer requests of this church, Lord, we just want to lift them up before you. Some of them come with um, anonymity and just thinking of people who are going through some tests right now that are really difficult things to think about. And uh, Lord, there's multiple people who are going through these kinds of things right now where uh, the future is a little uncertain. Lord, we just pray that you would strengthen them with the power of your Holy Spirit, that you give them strength in this hour to get through this next trial. Lord, knowing that there are those days when we don't walk with you, but you carry us and you, and you bring us to places of pasture and peace, uh, which you have created for us. Lord, we pray for uh, those who are sick and in the hospital this hour. We think specifically of Wayne Rowland. Lord, we thank you for his uh, recovery, that he's, he's uh, made it through the surgery, granted with an extra piece of equipment that he wasn't intending, but Lord, we thank you that you have, uh, you have raised him and you've healed him so that he might continue to glorify you to the best of his ability. Lord, we just pray that you be with him and the rest of the family. Lord, we do also pray for Mary Power's brother, uh, Ray, as he is one of these ones who've undergone some testing and, and has found some cancer. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, eradicate that in a divine way. Lord, we believe that you can heal. And we do also know that you ask us to pray for healing in faith. And Lord, we just lift him up in faith, believing uh, in you as the great healer and ask that you would re- eradicate this cancer for him. Lord, we pray for the other prayer requests that are on this bulletin, whether it's the Wades or Rachel and June or Sherry or Peggy or the McLaughlin family or the Ross family or the Hobbs, Joel Hobbs or the Barrett family or Evelyn Brown. Lord, we just lift them all up to you and ask that you watch them, watch over them real special today. Pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Uh-oh, my slide is starting again. Let's see here. All right. Just as a reminder of our vision statement one more time, uh, our vision is found in uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 42. And this idea of uh, fellowshipping one with one another is uh, laid heavily on my heart this year. And uh, I thank you for being here this morning because this is the primary place uh, for fellowship where we can come and be encouraged from the Lord's word and hear from scriptures and the public reading of scripture, and do service for each other, and be there to encourage one another. And so, although we are dedicated to the apostles' teaching, for sure, and I think we've talked about that a lot in the last couple of years, this year we're talking about uh, fellowship as best as we possibly can. And here, as I talked even with the Frog Club this morning about the road to Emmaus, there is this amazing fellowship that breaks out. I mean, these men hear uh, or see uh, Jesus Christ, will talk to Jesus Christ. Christ reveals himself to them, and the first thing they do is they just bolt uh, to fellowship. They go grab the other 11 disciples, and they share what the Lord is doing in their lives. And family, I just cannot encourage you enough to take part of every fellowship that you possibly uh, can. Our topic this morning for the sermon, however, is how do we come to know God? And I would like to answer this question from Uh, Luke chapter 24. So if you want to turn there with me, Luke chapter 24. If you remember last week, 
We were in Luke chapter 22. Uh, that was the beginning stages of Passion Week. That was Palm Sunday. If you wanted to continue on reading through Luke 22 and into Luke 23, then you would have the blessing of seeing the uh, persecution, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, all leading up into this day in Luke chapter uh, 24, where we have this wonderful story of the risen Christ uh, meeting with a couple of his disciples and just blowing their socks off with uh, their presence. Uh, again, I'm not taking the time to read Luke 24 so much because as I go through our sermon hour, I'm going to be reading those passages of scriptures as we go along, but I would definitely encourage you to stay there with me in Luke chapter 24. All right, so the question is, how do we come to know God? How do we come to know God? First off, I want to talk to you this morning about is the initiative of God, the initiative of God. Now, we read about some of this in Luke chapter 24, and here we see the road to Emmaus, starting in verse 13, and here, let me read a couple of these verses to you. Luke chapter 24, verse 13, it says, And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things which had taken place. Here, um, we see this storyline develop. Not because the disciples have done anything. Uh, they are just witnesses. They are just people who are experiencing something. And the thing that they are experiencing, they are eager to share with one another. They are just contemplating what all this means and, and talking about, hey, did you see that? Did you talk to so-and-so? Did you know that Christ did this? Do you know they whipped him like that? Did you, did you see them being, him being pulled into the temple? And Peter told me this, and, and he felt really bad about denying Christ and so on and so forth. You can just imagine how this conversation is going. They've had this great experience, and they're just talking through it. Again, it's a, an experience that came to them. They didn't initiate it. They are just present in the experience. And one of the ways that we need to understand about the gospel or about the way that Jesus comes to us or how we come to know God is that he is the great initiator. You have come to know God because he has initiated himself to you, not because you have, in your own prerogative, decided to try to figure out who God is, but rather God has been inspiring you right along to search for him. And one of these easy places that we can go to is John chapter 3 and verse 16. And of course, you probably already have it memorized from maybe your days as a, a child in Awana or whatever. But the, the simple verse just goes, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. This salvation message really is from God. He has thought about it since before he even created the world. And he knew that there would be a day where he would take the initiative to send his son to earth to pay the ultimate price for the people's sins so that they could have eternal life. And so here on the road to Emmaus, you see just these two people. They're just talking with each other about the things that were taking place. And in verse 15 of Luke 24, it says, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with him. And I just love that idea about how God um, comes in contact with us, comes to develop the, the salvation message in our hearts, if you will. And so I want to put a statement in here about verses 15 through 21, which I'll read to you. Is that And how, how do we come to know God? Number one, the initiative of God in coming to earth. And secondly, in creating and developing scripture in a prophetic way that we may believe in God and hope for a better tomorrow. And let me just read these verses to you as I qualify that statement. Beginning in verse 15, it says, While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with him. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now there's, as I said with the Frog Club this morning, there could be a lot of different reasons why their eyes were kept from recognizing him. I'll just name you one. I believe that Jesus Christ um, uh, and, and God himself were keeping the Jewish people, all of the Jewish people, from recognizing who Jesus was because they had blasphemed the name of the Lord 
early on in Jesus' ministry. And so even on the, the Palm Sunday story, if you go back to Luke 22, or if you go to qualifying other sections of scriptures around Luke 22, around Palm Sunday, before Christ actually enters Jerusalem, there is every child's favorite verse. The easiest one to memorize. It's two words, which is basically what? Jesus wept. And why is he weeping? Because he knew that he was going to go into a town and go through this horrendous experience and the Jewish people are still not going to accept who he was. They are blinded. They're under uh, a wrath of God in that moment. So here in Luke chapter 24, there is this blindness, whether it's from the wrath of God or like I said with the kids, whether Satan has blinded their eyes or whether it's tradition that cannot be outdone. Verse 16, their eyes were kept for recognizing him. Verse 17, and he said to them, what are these words that you were exchanging with one another as you were walking? And they came to stop, looking sad. Verse 18, one of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, are you possibly the only one living near Jerusalem who does not know about the things that's happened in these days? And he said to them, what sort of things? And they said to him, those about Jesus the Nazarene who proved to be a prophet mighty indeed and word in the sight of God and all the people and how the chief priests and rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Now, that's a very important phrase there in verse 21. These people were at least partially blind, not only because of God, but also because of the, the Old Testament scriptures. They believed that Israel would be redeemed. And if you just look at that word uh, in the Greek and understand that word in its complexity, you would understand that the word redeem has something to do with freedom or deliverance or, or liberation. And here in our man-made world, where we think mainly about what's happening in our world, not what's happening in all of eternity, or we're not necessarily thinking about the providence of God or the sovereignty of God on a daily basis, because we're just so consumed with our everyday life. Here are these people still consumed with everyday life, and that there's this occupation of Rome going on, and they were convinced that if Jesus was the Messiah, that, that he was going to establish his throne in this moment and free them from Roman occupation. Well, that is, that is part of the problem. In their religious construct, they, they were blind. They were only interpreting scripture one way, and that was the way of Christ uh, ruling and reigning on the earth someday, which he will do, but not at this time, okay? But here uh, in this section, uh, when we're talking about how God, how we came to know God, we need to understand that God has taken the initiative of coming to earth, and he has also taken the initiative in creating and developing scriptures. So God has given them, these people, all of scriptures to look back upon and to realize who he is. And as I've already said once before, these people have failed, even though they have the breath of the Old Testament at their disposal, failed to understand who Jesus was as their savior. But it doesn't mean that they didn't have the prophetic word to give them hope and a better tomorrow. They were, they were hoping for a better tomorrow, but they weren't hoping for salvation necessarily from sin, but rather a, a redeemed Israel out of the hands of Roman occupation. Thirdly, here we see about the initiative of God is that he is taking the initiative and in challenging our hearts to gaze into the supernatural that there is life after death. Now, let me read these verses to you, starting in verse 22. It says, But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb in the, in the morning. Here these men are talking with each other. And did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the woman also had said, but him they did not see. Okay? Um, verse 25, Christ is going to talk about how foolish they are for not believing scriptures. But the reality is, is these people were given something to look forward to. They were given a challenge to look at something greater than just this life. They were, they were given a supernatural hope to see a salvation that was uh, for all of eternity. It's not that Christ had come or uh, Christ has taken initiative in your life to just fix this life or to fix the, the, the uh, 
broken problems of this life, but he has come to take initiative to teach you about the supernatural realities of Christ, teach you about the supernatural things. And this one is a big one that they're trying to uh, put their arms around, trying to handle is what do we do with this idea of Christ who we know is dead because we have had the eyewitness accounts of it, who we saw placed in a tomb. And yet here are these ladies coming and saying that he is alive. He is alive. What, what do we do with that information? And here God is taking the initiative, not only in coming to earth, but telling the, telling the people that he was coming to earth, but also thirdly, challenging their hearts to think beyond this life, think about it in a supernatural way, thinking about their life after death. Second thing that I want to go over with you is the explanation of God. So how do we come to know God? Number one, the initiative of God. God takes initiative in all things. But two, as we go through this section of scripture, we also see the explanation of God, that God himself will use the scriptures to win the loss. And so as these men were contemplating what happened to Christ in verse 25, he says to them, you foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And so there's a lot of different ways, if you will, that we can evangelize the lost. There's a lot of different ways where we can seek to win the lost. You know, we can try through silly gimmicks to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the reality is, is when Christ came to take initiative to explain what he was doing on earth and for them, he didn't go to some dumb gimmick. He went to the word of God. And through the word of God, he presented himself to these people. And that's important. Okay, we, if we're going to uh, understand who God is and understand who Christ is, you go to scripture, all right? You don't base your religious experience or your spiritual off off some experience you've had with Mary at a tomb and forget all that, all right? What does scripture say? That is how Christ and God is going to reveal himself to you. In fact, all we really have to do is just um, hear the word, hear it preached. And for example, if you go to Romans chapter 10, I'll give you a, another famous section of scripture that Paul uses to talk about how uh, faith comes into the lives of believers. And it isn't some foreign concept. It isn't some weird thing to think about. It is literally like, did they hear the word of God? Romans chapter 10 Beginning in verse 14, he writes, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, this is the Old Testament here, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news, for, us, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Verse 17, So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, all right? And so here on the road to Emmaus, these first disciples are living out, if you will, Romans 10 perfectly, and that they are strengthened in their faith by the literal words of Christ, <laughs> by Christ himself, who is explaining himself uh, through the scripture. The third thing that I want to go over to you with about how we come to know God, again, he takes the initiative, he explains himself through scripture, and thirdly, we see the fellowship of God. And this one is powerful, okay? Because in my mind, this is the hinge point. The, this, in this mind, everything is connected, but there is a responsibility that is yours. And when we read this story uh, on the road to Emmaus, we get to down to, uh, uh, well, let's just start in verse 27, when Christ was saying, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. Verse 28, and they approached the village where they were going, and he, that is Jesus, acted as though he were going further. Okay? Verse 29, and so they strongly urged him. That, that is a very important word. It's all one word in the original language, I believe. It is this we have, to, we have to do it in a couple of words, but they strongly urged him saying, stay with us for it is getting towards evening and the day is now nearly over. And so he went in to stay with them. And it came about when he had reclined at the table with them that he took the bread and blessed it 
And he broke it and began giving it to them. And here scripture says, their eyes were open. There is this fundamental thing going on here with, with Jesus in the sense that he can just deliver you the facts. You could be here this morning. You could hear all the facts of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You could hear all the absolute truths. I can tell you this stuff from eyewitness accounts and the 500 witnesses plus that were in the, old, in the, in the New Testament who saw Christ being risen again. And you could walk out of here without ever inviting the Lord Jesus Christ to stay with you. In that moment, you're, you're taking your eternal life in your own hands, okay? There is a fundamental responsibility that you've got to latch on to, and that is that you have got to invite him to stay. You know the facts, you see it in scripture, you appreciate the fact that he's taking initiative in your life, now you own it. And you say, Lord, come and be with me. I think Revelations 3.20 says it in a great way here. Christ is, is speaking to the church after he ascended into heaven and he is giving a specific message to this church, but it stands true for all churches. In Revelations chapter 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. And here at the road of Emmaus, we literally have this exact thing happening with Jesus Christ. He, he lived it out first, and then he tells you later in the timeline of the gospel that just like these disciples, if you ask me to stay, I'm coming. If you ask me to stay with you and explain more from scripture about how you can have eternal life or about how I am the eternal life, I'll be there for you. But you've, you've got to You've got to start owning this thing with me, okay? And so then we see the effects of God, number four. So we come to know God through, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 is also a good verse. Let me, let me, no, this is all tied up in the effects of God. Getting ahead of myself. So how do we come to know God? God's initiative by God's word, explaining himself and who he is and all the prophecy. Number three, because he fellowships with us. And number four, we see that we come to know God, and these are the effects of knowing God, okay? When these disciples get their hands on this idea of knowing God, it radically changes their life. Verse 31, it says here in Luke 24, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Immediately, uh, the effect of the gospel had something um, powerful happen in their life because as you've read or we've seen in the uh, clip there with the frog club, these folks couldn't contain themselves. They had to run out of there as fast as they can even though it was the dead of the night, even though it was the middle of the night, even though they had just told Jesus, stay with us because it's dark outside, because there's robbers probably outside who could hurt you, whatever the case may be. Listen, as soon as they got their hands around the truth, as soon as their eyes were open to who Jesus Christ was, it didn't matter what the obstacle was in life, they were on the road to talk about it. They, I can't wait to fellowship with other people because they need to hear the truth. The Christ is risen. I've seen it. He was there with me. He explained it from scripture. And yet, so often we have less enthusiasm about that. We, we lose enthusiasm somehow with the gospel of Christ. The reality is, as I've already said multiple times, if you want to flip there, you can. Because I'm not going to, I'm just going to read you the verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4. The reality is for, for most of the people in the world who do not know Christ, Paul talks to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. There is just, there is just this blindness in the world where it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter what we try to tell them doesn't matter how much we've explained scripture to them. The God of the world has blinded their eyes to the absolute truth of Jesus Christ and who he is. And it's a scary thought. It's an absolute scary thought. God forbid that we would be so blinded, even our own Christian walk. And guys, I, I, I restrain myself 
as much as I possibly can on almost every American holiday. But there's a lot of truth about how the world celebrates holidays that have absolutely nothing to do with scripture. And it is a counterfeit in order to keep the people blinded and focused on something else, all right? And, and I would encourage you that, you know, when you're walking through Walmart and if, the, if you see a product there that just doesn't scream, the Lord has risen, you're wasting your time, you know? There should be a shelf there full of Bibles that say, he has risen, here's your answer, come and get it. But we don't, we don't, we don't see that. Why? Because Satan is blinding the eyes as much as he possibly can from the absolute truth of the risen Christ. Well, the next point that I want to bring about the effects of God is that the scriptures light a fire in the depths of our heart. All right? These men were saying to one another as they were contemplating what just happened when they heard Jesus speaking in verse 32 of Luke 24. He says, they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And family, I want to say to you this morning, if you love the Lord and if you love scripture, you can't wait to come to a Sunday morning service to see the word of God broken open for the sheer hope that something would ignite your heart back on fire. I've seen a lot of preachers and sometimes I've fallen into the same thing where a preacher or a minister might get up and have a whole bunch of gimmicks, may tell a whole bunch of funny jokes. You know what? I'm not satisfied with that kind of preaching and neither should you be. The real joy of knowing the Lord is that you open up scripture and you just can't get enough of it. Your hearts are just burning on the inside because you want to know this God more deeply. And when you start to piece things together from point A to point B to point C, and God opens up your eyes and your your heart just explodes with love for what the Lord is doing in your life, you just aren't satisfied with any weak preaching anymore. In fact, Jeremiah 31, 33 says it that way. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their heart and I will be their God and they shall be my people. If we can get that kind of passion again for the law of God and for the truths of his word on our heart, written there where it's what we meditate on day and day, that's what we, that's what we should be after. That's the effect of knowing Jesus Christ. The, the, the scripture just lights something in us that cannot be extinguished. And lastly, last effect is we must share about what we already know. This point I've already given to you. Verse 33, they got up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem. They, they traveled that extra seven miles. So they traveled 14 miles now since they've met Jesus on the road and found the 11 gathered together and those that were with them saying, the Lord has really risen and appeared to Simon. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them by the breaking of the bread. And really that is one of the effects of God. One of the effects of knowing him fully is that you cannot stop yourself from sharing about the love of God. You cannot stop, sh- you cannot stop yourself from wanting other people to know the truth of scripture. And so you're willing to travel 14 miles on foot if it means that my brother would know, come to know the Lord, you know? I, I would challenge us even this year, family, as we close, that when we think about fellowship, we can soften it to such a, such a lame, meager way that is much different than the fellowship that is here found on the road to Emmaus. Okay, this was a fellowship that was all about, hey, whatever it takes to be with the body of Christ, whatever it takes to open up scripture, to have my hearts burn again with scripture for the Lord and, and sing his praise and tell other people, that's the kind of fellowship that I want. And church, we need more of that fellowship. We, we want you here on a Sunday morning. We want you here on a Sunday night. We want you here uh, with, the, with Jeremy and, and the other groups that are being led. We want you here to fellowship with us every chance you possibly get so that we can uh, talk about and be encouraged about what God is doing through our lives. All right, so 
Please don't play off fellowship. Enjoy it. It is the effect of the gospel where you cannot separate yourself from the church. You, you got to be there because it's your love. It's your joy. It's your heart. Knowing that Christ is risen and you have eternal life. Father God, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we do pray that it would burn in our hearts. And Lord, where maybe I failed to be less articulate, Lord, I just pray that you would be articulate and write these things on your people's hearts. Lord, give us a passion for your word. Give us energy and excitement about hitting the streets to tell about what happened today, that you have risen from the dead, and there is something supernatural going on, and I want to tell you about it. Lord, put that in all of our hearts, we pray. For those of our family members who do not know you yet, Lord, we just pray that you would invade their hearts. As we obey, Lord, we just pray that you would do what you do best, taking the initiative, opening them up to fellowship, teaching them from your word. And Lord, all we get to do is just be the beneficiary of seeing you work in their lives and just being there for them. I mean, we're the blessed ones, but Lord, we know behind the scenes, you've been doing all the work since the foundation of the time to make this moment successful to them. And Lord, we just pray that you would powerfully move your Holy Spirit into all of our family members this morning who do not know you and who do not burn uh, in love for you. Pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.